Hello and welcome. Hi, I'm Dave. And in this tutorial, we will be adding the Axios package to our React.js blog application. And it will help us request data from a development API that we will set up with JSON server. Axios actually makes requesting data easier than using the Fetch API. So let's get started. I'll go to the file tree and I'm going to click new folder. And the first thing I'll do is create a folder named data. And inside this folder, I'm going to create a file named db.json. And then inside the db.json, we're going to put data. You could actually copy it and modify it from our app component. And I'll open up the app component here. As you can see, we have a static state right now for posts set in the app component. And here we have four test posts and their objects inside an array. And you could just copy these and put them in there. I'm already going to paste in my formatted JSON and you can see it's just a little different than we have in the state. Here we have an object and we've given the object the name posts or the property posts and then the value for this property is the array with all of the posts like we have in the use state in our app component right now. Notice each of the properties are within quotes, and that is not the case in our JavaScript over here in the app component. So as you bring those over, ensure that you are formatting them like you see here in the db.json. I'm going to go ahead and save this, and now that I have the db.json file inside of our data folder, I'll go back to the app.js, and I'm just going to remove everything in the post state and replace it with an empty array, which is how we want to start out, and save. And that is really all we need to get JSON server up and running. So I'm going to collapse the source folder now and click on the package.json because we're going to add Axios as a new dependency. So after we install it, you should see it listed inside the dependencies of your package.json file. I'll quickly go to Chrome and here at npmjs.com, then slash package slash Axios, you can see the details for Axios and there's documentation here as well. And I will put a link to this in the description for this video. Going back to Visual Studio Code, I want to open up a terminal window. In Windows, I press Control and the back tick. You could also go to the terminal men menu at the top of Visual Studio Code to do that as well. And get rid of the help menu there that I opened by mistake. And now we can install Axios as a dependency. So I'll type npm i and then Axios and dash s is a habit of mine it's actually not required because it will save it by default and it will save it as a production dependency so we can just do npm i axios i'm going to press enter and when this finishes installing we'll go ahead and get started applying axios to our project you can now see axios has been added to our package.json file and we are ready to begin adding axios to our project Let's close the terminal window, and now let's open the source folder we see in the file tree, and let's add a new folder inside the source folder, and let's name the folder API. Inside the API folder, let's go ahead and create a file name posts, and then we'll put uh, JS, of course, post.js. And now that we've done that, we can import Axios from Axios, and now we need to set the base URL that we'll use for Axios throughout the project. So we can just set export default and say axios.create and then a parentheses and then a curly brace. Now on a separate line, we can define the base URL property and we'll set this to our HTTP slash slash local host. And then we need port 3500 that we're going to launch our JSON server on. And that's essentially all we need in this file. And now Axios will continue to use this base URL. And of course, when you would take this project live, you would need to change this base URL to whatever URL you got at your host. Okay, now that we've set the base URL for Axios, let's go ahead and open a terminal window. And inside this first terminal window, let's launch JSON server. So we'll type npx and then json server dash p and then 3500 for the port 
and then dash w for watch, and that will be data slash db dot json. Press enter, and that should launch our JSON server instance. And after we get that started, we'll go ahead and launch our React app in another terminal window. Okay, to open a second terminal window, I'm just going to click the plus sign here. And now you can see we've got a little tree on the right that shows our different terminal windows. In this terminal window, I'm going to launch our React app just by typing npm start. And once we get this started, we shouldn't see any posts because we've changed the state. But then the React app will show any changes we make as we add Axios into our application. And now our application is loaded with no posts to display as we expected since we cleared out the static state. I'll go ahead and resize the window so we can see it on half of the screen. And then I'll resize Visual Studio Code as well. And now we can work on our code on the left and view Chrome on the right. I'm going to close the terminal windows, although they will continue to run and we can reopen them at any time. Also going to collapse the open editors area over here in Visual Studio Code so we can see a little bit more of the file tree. And we're ready to begin in app.js. Okay, in app.js, I'm going to hide the file tree quickly. I do that by pressing Control B in Visual Studio Code. I'm using Windows. It may be different in Mac and Linux. But what we need to do at the top is import our API. So I'll just add another line under where we imported format. And here I'll import API, and this will be from dot slash API, but remember that's a folder and we can see Visual Studio Code shows us that. So we'll select that and then we have posts inside the folder. So now we've imported the API and we can use it in the application. I'm going to scroll down and underneath our use history line here on line 20, I'm going to press return and start another use effect. And this use effect is where we will fetch our data. And we only want this to happen at load time. So our dependency should be an empty array. Inside this use effect, we need to define our fetch function. And I'll call this fetch posts. And it should be an async function. Inside the async function, we're going to have a try block. And of course, to follow that up, a catch block where we catch any possible error. And now we need to simply define how to use Axios. And we'll define a response just like we would with fetch. And we'll set this equal to await API. Remember that is the Axios instance we're importing. And then we can use get. And this is where Axios becomes very easy to understand. We actually use the verbiage, the words, that we would in a CRUD operation, possibly in API usage. So like HTTP uses git, post, put, uh, delete, there's patch, and uh, a few others, but we're only going to use the basic CRUD operations. So git would be our read operation in CRUD. And so now we just need to say what endpoint we want with that base URL. And of course, we only have one endpoint with this application and its posts. So we'll go ahead and define that. Now, this replaces fetch. And then what's so nice about using Axios instead of fetch is Axios automatically uh, creates that JSON. We don't have that second step here where we have to define data and set it equal to response.json. Another thing that is nice about Axios is it will automatically catch the errors when they are not in the 200 range of HTTP responses. So before where we would have said if the response.ok is false with the exclamation mark there, we don't have to do that either. Axios will automatically catch anything outside of the 200 range. So what we can do now is just set our state with set posts because if we get to this point, an error has not occurred and we know it's already in the 200 range. And our data is going to be in the response.data. Now you may see some at this point would say, okay, if we have the response, 
which we should at this point. It should only be in the 200 range. And they might say if we have response.data. And you could do this to be extra careful if you want to. I'm not going to do that because right now I know I've got a response in the 200 range. And if I have that, our JSON server is absolutely going to send data back. And if you are working with somebody else that's developing the back end, you might already know that you will be getting a response in that 200 range. If not, that is how you could check for that to make sure you have a response and response data. I'm just going to leave it like this. And we can set that response right here for the posts. And that's as simple as it is really. That is using Axios to get the posts and setting the post state right there. Now Axios catches those errors that I mentioned. And what we can do, this is directly from the documentation. We can say if this is not in the 200 response range, then I'm just going to copy and paste some things directly from the Axios documentation. And Axios will provide these errors. And so you could log all of these different things if you wanted them. So you would get error.response.data right here. And so if your backend was sending a message at this point, you would actually receive the message if that was the property like that. It just depends on what the backend is delivering when it's not in the 200 range. So you have to know what you're dealing with on the API that you're working with to actually know what property to pull out of that data. You could also get the status and the headers. But then Axios will also catch other possible errors here. So what we can do is say up above this, we can say if error.response, that means we've got a response property. Well here, just need the one. And now I'll put the curly brace at the end. And this is when you'll see these responses. But then we can say else, and this means error.response is undefined. So if that's the case, we can just log the error message. And I'll copy and paste this in, but we've done this before. This is a template literal, and now we're getting the error message property. And so here we know we did not get a 200, or we did not get a response at all. I'm sorry. Here we know we didn't get a response in the 200 range, but we got a response from the back end API. Here, there was possibly no response, or we got a 404, or something else occurred, but this catches all the other errors right here. Again, this is directly from the documentation for Axios, and it handles those errors very well. So we can pull out extra data if we need to, and we can define between those. All of that said, our function for fetch posts is now defined, but what we still need to do is call fetch posts here inside of the use effect. So let's save this. And now we have our posts once again over here on the right. And so our use effect works as soon as the page loads. And of course, our development server loaded the page as soon as we saved our changes. And we now have those posts. Now, if you remember, we can post a new blog or a, make a new post on the post page in our application. So the next thing we need to adjust in our application to use Axios is the handle submit function. Handle submit has a few lines of code that are just a little longer, so I'm going to expand Visual Studio Code. We will come back and show the application after we complete this code addition for Axios. And of course, this would be the create portion of a CRUD application, the C in CRUD, where we're creating a new post. So after the line 54 that defines new post, we need to start our try block here. And of course, I'll delete that ending curly brace, but everything that we see here is really going to be in the try block because we won't want to make any of those things happen if we fail our attempt here. But we do need to go ahead and catch an error again. And here, instead of everything I posted above from the documentation for Axios, we'll just console.log and we'll once again have a template literal. So I'll say error and then inside here 
we will put the error.message. So at least we know we're grabbing the message and logging it. You could expand upon this. You could put what I did above in the use effect when we're fetching and handle the errors how you want to. But at least we are acknowledging we might get an error here and this is what we'll do for it in this uh, development application. So in the try block, we need to define a response once again. So we'll say const response and we'll set that equal to await API, but now we'll use post instead of git because we're posting a new uh, blog post. And then we need to define the endpoint, posts, and then we're going to pass in the new post, and that is the data we're sending. After that, let's, well, we don't need a new line. Let's just look at all posts because we need to alter that. We're going to take all the posts we had previously, and now instead of the new post here, we're going to use the response.data. This should be the same as the new post, actually. It should just be the API sending us the data back and confirming that. But we'll go ahead and use response.data here instead of the new post. And then we can set the post to all posts. We can still empty out our controlled form that has the title and the body. And we can use history.push to go back to the actual blog and see the full list in the feed. And so nothing else really changes. We're just using Axios and it's really that simple to send the new data and then we're going to update the state with the actual response we get from the API as well and get that dot data out of the response. So let's save that and I'll resize Visual Studio Code again. And it looks like we have a problem here because I didn't put async at the top of the handle submit. So we can't await without it. I'll put async on line 50 where we define handle submit and we should be good. So let's make a test post for tutorial. And here is my test post. And here it is. With that working, let's go ahead and set up the easiest part of the CRUD operations, which is the delete. We've completed the read, which was git, and create, which was post. Let's go ahead and add the handle delete. I need to remember the async above here, as I had to add later inside of the handle submit, but we'll put it right away here with handle delete. And then we'll start our try block. And as before, everything we already had is going to be inside of our try block. Then after that, I'm just going to copy the catch block from the other function and put it here. You can expand on that as I discussed with the Axios documentation if you want to. And here inside of try, we will not get a response. We just want to await the API call delete and now I'll put a template literal because we need to pass in the endpoint post, but we also need the specific post ID to be passed along. And after that, everything else should essentially be the same. So let's go ahead and save. And now let's go to the detail page for this test post for tutorial and delete the post. And everything seems to be working as it should for the delete operation as well. And now the most complex operation of the CRUD operations, we've got create, read, and delete completed, but is the update. And we haven't really added an update component to our application either, so we're going to need to do that. But first, I'll create the function. And let's just call this handle edit, because we're going to edit a post. And again, this will be async, and we need the ID. Now inside the handle edit, we're going to need some new state as well. So let's scroll up to the top, and just like we have the post body and post title, we're, let's create an edit title and edit body. So I'll copy both of these and come down here. And let's go ahead and just select post title both times and then change post to edit. And I'll change this one to a capital E. And we can do the same here for post and change it to edit and change this one to a capital E as well. So now we've got edit title, edit body, set edit title, set edit body, and we'll use those in our function here for handle edit. We're going to start out though needing the date, time, and the new post much like we do in this function above. So I'll just copy both of these down 
and in here I will paste both of those. The date time will change, or it will not change actually. The new post, let's call this updated post. And now instead of post title, I'm going to have edit title. And let me expand Visual Studio Code for now. Instead of post body, we're going to have edit body because this will be a controlled form where we make the edits as well. And so we need those pieces of state for the controlled form. Now we can start our try block. And of course, after the try block, we'll have the catch block. And I'll just copy that down as well. So now we can put our information inside of the try block. We'll start with a response and we'll set that equal to await, call our API, and now we'll call put. We could use patch if we were updating specific fields, but here we'll essentially be replacing the entire post. So we're going to use put and we'll put in the endpoint posts. But again, this will need to be specific to the ID of the post. After that, we'll be passing in our new data, which is the updated post. Okay, now that we have got the response back from Axios and the backend API, we'll use set posts here. But this will be just a little more complicated than we have previously uh, completed a set post, like we did up here, where we just passed in all the posts after we defined the post, because we need to use map. That is, if we didn't use map, we would be creating a array of posts here, but we'd still have in the old post as we added in the new post as well. And we need to eliminate that old post and just add in the new information. So with map, we'll have each post iterated through and map creates a new array, which is exactly what we need. So we'll check the post ID and if it's equal to the ID we passed in, this will be a ternary statement. And we'll say, okay, let's use the response data, which is the new post information, if the ID is equal to the post ID passed in. If not, let's just go ahead and pass in the post as it is. So that means only for where the post IDs match will we pass in the new data, which is essentially the updated post. But we're going to use the response data here, destructured with the operator right here. And if not, we'll of course pass in the post as it currently exists because that does not need to change. So that will update our post state. And now we'll still need to set edit title back to blank. And then we'll also need to set edit body back to blank because again, we don't want to uh, hold that data over for the controlled form in any way. After that, we'll use the history once again and push so we go back to the main feed so we can see our edited post amongst all the other posts and save. That should complete the handle edit function. Let's go ahead and resize Visual Studio Code just to make sure there were no errors as we saved, but it looks like the application went ahead and loaded as expected. Right now we have no way to get to a new component and we don't even have the edit component yet. So let's create the edit component and the pathway to get to it. I'm going to show the file tree again in Visual Studio Code. I'll highlight the source folder and then I'll create a new file and call this edit post.js. Once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and expand Visual Studio Code again. I'm going to press Control Alt and the letter R to use my uh, ES7 React snippets. And here I'm going to type underscore R-A-F-C-E to get that functional component. You don't have to do that. You can type this out as well if you do not have that extension. I'll link to the extension in the description below. Okay, we need to make some imports at the top of this component. The first one's going to be use effect. And after use effect, we'll say from React. Then we'll also import a couple of things from React Wrap. One is use params, and the other is link. And it's not just React Router, it's React Router dash DOM. Visual Studio Code wants to help, but it's got to get that part right. Okay, in edit post, we're going to be bringing in some props here and there's enough. I'm going to put them on a separate line. We'll need all the posts. We'll need our handle edit function. 
we will need the edit body, the set edit body, we'll need the edit title, and the set edit title. After that, we can start in on our function. And this is really a combination of our new post page, where we created a new post with a controlled form, but also our post detail page, where we pulled in the post detail from a parameter. And that's why we're using use params. So we're going to start off here in the function, and I guess I came down one line too far. I'll create this ID just like we did in our post page to get the post detail and we'll use params to get that ID attribute that we're going to set in the route. And then we need to get the specific post. So we'll set this equal to posts find. And once again, this is just like we did on the post detail page. And this will be post.id to string because when it comes out of the param in the URL, it is a string, and that's what we're matching. And so we have to set the post ID to string to actually use strict equals. You could just use the double equals and not do the to string part. So it would be your preference which way to go there. But now that we have the post and the ID, we can go ahead and use effect. And this is when this loads, we need to pull in this data and set the state for that. So let's go ahead and say we're going to put in post, set edit title, and set edit body as the dependencies. And now inside use effect, we'll actually need to set the state for both of those. And we'll say if we have a post, because there is a chance the page could be requested and a post would not exist. So we'll say if we have the post, set post title, and this will be post title. And then, oh, I'm sorry, not set post title, it would be set edit title. Here we go, set edit title. And then set edit body, and it would be post.body here. Now that we have those, we've set the state, and so the form will already be filled out, and our controlled form will be ready to edit the existing post. The body of the page itself will be much like the new post page. So let's just go to the new post page and select from the beginning of the main element to the closing main element, and then go back to our edit post page where we can just highlight the divs and replace those with what we have on the new post page. We'll leave the class name new post the same. So the form here is formatted just like it is on the new post page, so we won't change that. However, after the main element, let's go ahead and put a curly brace and say, if we have an edit title. So the post will need to exist for us to have set an edit title, and then we can put a curly brace afterwards. But you can see Visual Studio Code doesn't like this right now, because in JSX, you have to have a parent element and currently, we do not have a parent element set. We have, oh, I didn't mean to put it after the main, actually. So let's change that and put it after the form. And tab this curly brace over. Not getting the tabs I want with the current error here. And the error means we need to set a fragment in here as the parent element. And now you can see Visual Studio Code is much happier and doesn't have all the red lines. So let's tab this over and then tab over. Here we go. Because our H2 and our form, were neither one was apparent. They were sibling elements. So that's why JSX and Visual Studio Code would not accept that. Now that we've done that, let's change this new post title to Edit Post. And let's go ahead and update the form a little bit. We can keep the same class name here, new post form. We want the same uh, formatting from CSS. But handle submit will not be called an on submit. Instead, here we will prevent default, as we often do with the form, inside of the on submit call for the form. So when that happens, that means inside the button here, we're going to need to have and on click, and we can set this equal to an anonymous function. And inside this anonymous function, we'll call the handle edit, 
and we need to pass in the post ID here. And that's why we're not doing that in the on submit area. Now for our controlled form to work, we need to go ahead and update some of the names here. Instead of post title, it would be edit title. Instead of set post title, it would be set edit title. And that would be the same here. Instead of post body, it's going to be edit body. Instead of set post body, it's going to be set edit body. We could change the IDs here, but we know this component will not load at the same time as our new form or our new post form. So we don't really need to. There'll only be one on the page at a time. So this should work for us. Once we save these changes, we've created our new component, but it is still not being routed to in the app.js. We still have no way of getting there. So let's go to our app.js and let's scroll down to our routes and let's copy this post with the exact path and paste it below. We can remove the exact. We're actually going to change the path to edit and then we'll need to have the ID parameter afterwards. So there we have edit and slash ID parameter. This will not be new post, it will be edit post. And now let's pass all the props we need here. We need posts equals posts. Instead of handle submit, this will be handle edit. And now instead of post title, we'll have edit title. I should have selected both of those. Edit title, I will do that now. So here instead of set post title, it will be edit title. Post body will be edit body and set post body will be set edit body. Now we've got all the props being passed and we've got the correct route in. We just need to create the link and have a way to go to that route. Let's quickly go back to our edit post page. I just thought of something that we didn't complete. We have the if edit title exists, which essentially is saying if the post exists, we're going to go ahead and show the form. But if not, and there is the chance that a post will not exist and that the page could be requested, we need to go ahead and update this. And this shouldn't be post title, this should be edit title. But here this says, if we do not have a title, essentially if the post does not exist, we need to pass in our post not found information here, which is where we use the React Router link to go back to the home page. So now we've completed the edit post component and back in the app.js, we completed the routing. And so now that we have the routing, we just need to create a link to the edit page. Well, we have a delete button on the post page. So that would be a good page to possibly put another button that would allow us to edit as well. Directly above the delete button, we can use link, which we've already imported above from React Router, and set this to, and now we can put in a template literal and pass in the edit path. And here, this will need to be the post.id. Now that we've created the link, inside the link, we can put a button. And let's give this a class name to differentiate it from the delete button. Here we'll say this is the edit button. Let's hide the file tree because I'm going to run out of room. And after that, we go ahead and put some text on the button. We'll just say edit post. That looks good. Let's go ahead and give the delete button a class name as well. We'll set this equal to delete button and we need the ending quote. There we go. And we save that. And that's really all the change we need to make to the post page. We may need to tweak the CSS just a little bit, but this should be fine now. One more late addition to the app.js that I didn't think to do when we put in the route would be to go ahead and import the edit post component at the top. So let's fix that by coming up here right under the post page. We'll say import edit post from slash edit post and save. Now let's look at our application, see if we have any other errors. Everything looks like it's still loading correctly. I'll just reload to make sure. There we go. Let's click on testing a fourth post here. We have an edit post button. 
Yes, we might want to change the color with those new classes we added and differentiate, maybe add a little space, but it looks okay. If we click Edit Post, we've got the post here ready to edit. You can see the form is already filled out. So let's say some more testing paragraphs instead with a few dots. Click, and it looks like we edited our post just fine. I'll click that, and yes, some more testing paragraphs. Looks good. We could possibly go back to the home and create a new post, and here this form is empty, but it's a controlled post, so we'll say another post once again, and we've created another post. So that's all working well. We could possibly edit this post once again with an exclamation mark. And yes, it's working just fine. The only other thing we might do to check for errors is right click and choose inspect, or you could press control shift in the letter I. And we'll check the console to see what the console is telling us as far as any errors or warnings. But no, it looks like it is clear. We can reload and see if React gives us anything new. Nope, it is fine. So we're good to go from DevTools there. So let's go ahead and go back to Visual Studio Code, and then click on index.css. And if you scroll to around 200, or around line 200 from what we've already had, we can make just a few changes here. First of all, on my line 203, I'm going to remove the H2, missing H2, and post page H2. And then I'm going to put a comma, and I'm going to add new post, and the paragraph for the new post class as well. And then instead of margin bottom, I'm going to make this margin top. So we can save that change, and we should see that on the post page, nothing has changed here. But if we come back to home and go here, we edit the post. This looks good too. Now, let's say let's try to edit a post that doesn't exist, and the post not found page looks good as well. Now let's go back. And let's, here we are on the edit post page. We want to fix these buttons. Actually, this is on the post page, and when we would click edit post, it would take us to the edit post page. But yes, we want to fix these buttons, and let's take the background color red out of the button definition. And so now they're just plain old buttons here. They both still have a white text color. But let's create the class delete button that we applied to our delete button and make it red. And now that will change. And then let's go ahead and create this edit button class that we also applied. But instead of red, we'll change that to the same color as the nav menu. And now the edit post and delete post buttons look a little better. We just need a little space there. So beside the padding that is 0.5 RAM, let's say the margin right. 0.5 room as well. And now we get a little space between the two buttons. Everything seems to be working well. We can read posts, we can create new posts, we can delete posts, and we can edit posts as well. So we have applied Axios and all CRUD operations to our application, and we should be good to go and move on to custom hooks in the next tutorial. Hey, thank you guys so much for liking the video if it helped you get started with React. Also, I appreciate you watching and subscribing. It's helping my channel grow. Take care and I'll see you again very soon.